Chapter 52 Krishna Kidnaps Rukmini After hearing Rukmini's statement, Lord Krishna was very pleased. He immediately shook hands with the Brahmin and said, My dear Brahmin, I am very glad to hear that Rukmini is anxious to marry me, since I am also anxious to get her hand. My mind is always absorbed in the thought of the daughter of Bhishmaka, and sometimes I cannot sleep at night because I am thinking of her. I can understand that the marriage of Rukmini with Shishupal has been arranged by her elder brother in a spirit of animosity toward me. So I am determined to give a good lesson to all of these princes. Just as fire is extracted and utilized after manipulating ordinary wood, similarly, after dealing with these demoniac princes, I shall bring forth Rukmini like fire from their midst. Krishna, upon being informed of the specific date of Rukmini's marriage, became anxious to leave immediately. He asked his driver Daruka to harness the horses for his chariot and prepare to go to the kingdom of Vidarbha. The driver, just after hearing this order, brought Krishna's four special horses. The names and descriptions of these horses are mentioned in the Padma Purana. The first one, Shaivya, was greenish. The second, Sugriva, was grayish like ice. The third, Megapushpa, was the color of a new cloud. And the last, Balahaka, was of ashen color. When the horses were yoked and the chariot ready to go, Krishna helped the Brahmin up and gave him a seat by his side. Immediately they started from Dwarka and within one night arrived at the province of Vidarbha. The kingdom of Dwarka is situated in the western part of India, and Vidarbha is situated in the northern part. They are separated by a distance of not less than 1,000 miles, but the horses were so fast that they reached their destination, a town called Kundina, within one night, or at most 12 hours. King Bhishmaka was not very enthusiastic about handing his daughter over to Shishupal, but he was obliged to accept the marriage settlement due to his affectionate attachment for his eldest son, who had negotiated it. As a matter of duty, he was decorating the city for the marriage ceremony and was acting in great earnestness to make it very successful. Water was sprinkled all over the streets and the city was cleansed very nicely. Since India is situated in the tropical zone, the atmosphere is always dry. Due to this, dust always accumulates on the streets and roads, so they must be sprinkled with water at least once a day, and in big cities like Calcutta, twice a day. The roads of Kundina were arranged with colored flags and festoons, and gates were constructed at particular crossings. The whole city was decorated very nicely. The beauty of the city was enhanced by the inhabitants, both men and women, who were dressed in washed cloth, decorated with sandalwood pulp, pearl necklaces, and flower garlands. Incense was burning everywhere, and fragrances like agaru scented the air. Priests and Brahmins were sumptuously fed and, according to ritualistic ceremony, were given sufficient wealth and cows in charity. In this way, they were engaged in chanting Vedic hymns. The king's daughter, Rukmini, was exquisitely beautiful. She was very clean and had beautiful teeth. The auspicious sacred girdle was tied on her wrist. She was given various types of jewelry to put on and long silken cloth to cover the upper and lower parts of her body. Learned priests gave her protection by chanting mantras from the Samaveda, Rigveda, and Yajurveda. After this, they chanted mantras from the Atarva Veda and offered oblations in the fire to pacify the ominous conjunctions of different stars. King Bhishmaka was very experienced in dealing with the Brahmins and priests when such ceremonies were held. He specifically distinguished the Brahmins by giving them large quantities of gold and silver, grains mixed with molasses, and cows decorated with golden ornaments. Damagosh, Shishupal's father, executed all kinds of ritualistic performances to invoke good fortune for his own family. 
Shishupal's father was known as Damagosh due to his superior ability to cut down unregulated citizens. Dama means curbing down, and Ghosh means famous. So he was famous for controlling the citizens. Dama Ghosh thought that if Krishna came to disturb the marriage ceremony, he would certainly cut him down with his military power. Therefore, after performing the various auspicious ceremonies, Dama Ghosh gathered his military divisions known as Madash Ravi. He took many elephants, garlanded with golden necklaces, and many chariots and horses, which were similarly decorated. It appeared that Damagosh, along with his son and other companions, was going to Kundina, not completely forgetting the marriage, but mainly intent on fighting. When King Bishmaka learned that Damagosh and his party were arriving, he left the city to receive them. Outside the city gate, there were many gardens where the guests were welcome to stay. In the Vedic system of marriage, the bride's father receives the large party of the bridegroom and accommodates them in a suitable place for two or three days until the marriage ceremony is performed. The party led by Damagosh contained thousands of men, among whom the prominent kings and personalities were Jarasandha, Dantavakra, Vidurat, and Pandraka. It was an open secret that Rukmini was meant to be married to Krishna, but that her elder brother, Rukmi, had arranged her marriage to Sishupal. There was also some whispering going on about a rumor that Rukmini had sent a messenger to Krishna. Therefore, the soldiers suspected that Krishna might cause a disturbance by attempting to kidnap Rukmini. Even though they were not without fear, they were all prepared to give Krishna a nice fight in order to prevent the girl from being taken away. Sri Balaram received the news that Krishna had left for Kundina accompanied only by a Brahmin. He also heard that Shishupal was there with a large number of soldiers. Suspecting that they would attack Krishna, Balaram took strong military divisions of chariots, infantry, horses, and elephants, and arrived at the precinct of Kundina. Meanwhile, inside the palace, Rukmini was expecting Krishna to arrive, but when neither he nor the Brahmin who took her message appeared, she became full of anxiety and began to think how unfortunate she was. There is only one night between today and my marriage day, and still neither the Brahmin nor Shamasundar has returned. I cannot ascertain any reason for this. Having little hope, she thought perhaps Krishna had found reason to become dissatisfied and had rejected her fair proposal. As a result, the Brahmin might have become disappointed and not come back. Although she was thinking of various causes for the delay, she expected them both at every moment. Rukmini further began to think the demigods such as Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, and the goddess Durga might have been displeased. It is generally said that the demigods become angry when they are not properly worshipped. For instance, when Indra found that the inhabitants of Vrindavan were not worshipping him, Krishna having stopped the Indra Yajna, he became very angry and wanted to chastise them. Thus, Rukmini was thinking that since she did not worship Lord Shiva or Lord Brahma very much, they might have become angry and tried to frustrate her plan. Similarly, she thought that the goddess Durga, the wife of Lord Shiva, might have taken the side of her husband. Lord Shiva is known as Rudra and his wife is known as Rudrani. Rudrani and Rudra refer to those who are very accustomed to putting others in a distressed condition so they might cry forever. Rukmini was thinking of the goddess Durga as Girija, the daughter of the Himalayan mountains. The Himalayan mountains are very cold and hard, and she thought of the goddess Durga as hard-hearted and cold. In her anxiety to see Krishna, Rukmini, who was, after all, still a child, thought this way about the different demigods. The gopis worshipped goddess Kachyayani to get Krishna as their husband. Similarly, Rukmini was thinking of the various types of demigods, not for material benefit, 
but in respect to Krishna. Praying to the demigods to achieve the favor of Krishna is not irregular, and Rukmini was fully absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. Even though she pacified herself by thinking that the time for Govinda to arrive had not yet expired, Rukmini felt that she was hoping against hope. She began to shed tears, and when they became more forceful, she closed her eyes in helplessness. While Rukmini was in such deep thought, auspicious symptoms appeared in different parts of her body. Trembling began to occur in her left eyelid and in her arms and thighs. When trembling occurs in these parts of the body, it is an auspicious sign indicating that something lucrative can be expected. Just then, Rukmini, full of anxiety, saw the Brahmin messenger. Krishna, being the super-soul of all living beings, could understand Rukmini's anxiety. Therefore, he sent the Brahmin inside the palace to let her know that he had arrived. When Rukmini saw the Brahmin, she could understand the auspicious trembling of her body and immediately became elated. She smiled and inquired from him whether or not Krishna had already come. The Brahmin replied that the son of the Yadu dynasty, Sri Krishna, had arrived. He further encouraged her by saying that Krishna had promised to carry her away without fail. Rukmini was so elated by the Brahmin's message that she wanted to give him in charity everything she possessed. However, finding nothing suitable for presentation, she simply offered him her respectful obeisances. The significance of offering respectful obeisances to a superior is that the one offering obeisances is obliged to the respected person. In other words, Rukmini implied that she would remain ever grateful to the Brahmin. Anyone who gets the favor of the goddess of fortune, as did this Brahmin, is without a doubt always happy in material opulence. When King Bhishmaka heard that Krishna and Balaram had come, he invited them to see the marriage ceremony of his daughter. Immediately he arranged to receive them along with their soldiers in a suitable garden house. As was the Vedic custom, the king offered Krishna and Balaram honey and fresh washed cloth. He was hospitable not only to Krishna, Balaram, and kings such as Jarasandha, but he also received many other kings and princes according to their respective personal strength, age, and material possessions. Out of curiosity and eagerness, the people of Kundina assembled before Krishna and Balaram and began to drink the nectar of their beauty. With tearful eyes, they offered them their silent respects. They were very pleased considering Lord Krishna the suitable match for Rukmini. They were so eager to unite Krishna and Rukmini that they began to pray to the Personality of Godhead. My dear Lord, if we have performed any pious activities that you are satisfied with, kindly be merciful upon us and accept the hand of Rukmini. It appears that Rukmini was a very popular princess, and all the citizens, out of intense love for her, prayed for her best fortune. In the meantime, Rukmini, being very nicely dressed and protected by bodyguards, came out of the palace to visit the temple of Ambika, the goddess Durga. Deity worship in the temple has been in existence since the beginning of Vedic culture. There is a class of men described in the Bhagavad Gita as the Veda Vadarata. They only believe in the Vedic ritualistic ceremonies, but not in the temple worship. Such foolish people may here take note that although this marriage of Krishna and Rukmini took place more than 5,000 years ago, there were arrangements for temple worship. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says, Yanti Deva Vrata Devan. The worshippers of the demigods attain the abodes of the demigods. There were many people who worshipped the demigods and many who directly worshipped the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The system of demigod worship was directed mainly to Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, Lord Ganesh, the sun god, and the goddess Durga. Lord Shiva and the goddess Durga were worshipped even by the royal families. Other minor demigods were worshipped by silly, inferior people. As far as the Brahmins and Vaishnavas are concerned, 
They simply worship Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In the Bhagavad Gita, the worship of demigods is condemned, but not forbidden. There it is clearly stated that the less intelligent class of men worship the different kinds of demigods for material benefit. On the other hand, even though Rukmini was the goddess of fortune, she went to the temple of the goddess Durga because the family deity was worshipped there. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is stated that as Rukmini was proceeding towards the temple of the goddess Durga, within her heart she was always thinking of the lotus feet of Krishna. Therefore, when Rukmini went to the temple, it was not with the intention of an ordinary person who goes to beg for material benefits. Her only target was Krishna. When people go to the temple of a demigod, the objective is actually Krishna, since it is he who empowers the demigods to provide material benefits. As Rukmini proceeded toward the temple, she was very silent and grave. Her mother and her girlfriend were by her side, and the wife of a Brahmin was in the center. Surrounding her were bodyguards. This custom of a would-be bride going to the temple of a demigod is still practiced in India. As the procession continued, various musical sounds were heard. Drums, conch shells, and bugles of different sizes, such as panavas, turyas, and beris, combined to make a sound which was not only auspicious, but very sweet to hear. There were thousands of wives of respectable Brahmins present. These women were all dressed very nicely with suitable ornaments. They presented Rukmini with flower garlands, sandalwood pulp, and a variety of colorful garments to assist her in worshipping Lord Shiva and the goddess Durga. Some of these ladies were very old and knew perfectly well how to chant prayers to the goddess Durga and Lord Shiva. So, followed by Rukmini and others, they led these prayers before the deity. Rukmini offered her prayers to the deity by saying, My dear goddess Durga, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you as well as to your children. The goddess Durga has four famous children, two daughters, the goddess of fortune Lakshmi and the goddess of learning Saraswati, and two famous sons, Lord Ganesh and Lord Kartikeya. They are all considered to be demigods and goddesses. Since the goddess Durga is always worshipped along with her famous children, Rukmini specifically offered her respectful obeisances to the deity in that way. However, her prayers were different. Ordinary people pray to the goddess Durga for material wealth, fame, profit, strength, and so on. Rukmini, however, desired to have Krishna for her husband and therefore prayed to the deity to be pleased upon her and bless her. Since she desired only Krishna, her worship of the demigods is not condemned. While Rukmini was praying, a variety of items were presented before the deity, chief of which were water, different kinds of flames, incense, garments, garlands, and various foodstuffs, prepared with ghee, such as puris and kachoris. There were also fruits, sugar cane, betel nuts, and spices offered. With great devotion, Rukmini offered them to the deity according to the regulative principles directed by the old Brahmin ladies. After this ritualistic ceremony, the ladies offered the remnants of the foodstuffs to Rukmini as prasadam, which she accepted with great respect. Then Rukmini offered her obeisances to the ladies and to the goddess Durga. After the business of deity worship was finished, Rukmini caught hold of the hand of one of her girlfriends and left the temple, accompanied by the others. All the princes and visitors who came to Kandina for the marriage were assembled outside the temple to see Rukmini. The princes were especially very eager to have her because they all actually thought that they would have Rukmini as their wife. Struck with wonder upon seeing Rukmini, they thought that she was specially manufactured by the Creator to bewilder all the great chivalrous princes. Her body was well constructed, the middle portion being thin. She had green eyes, pink lips, and a beautiful face which was enhanced by her scattered hair and by different kinds of earrings. 
Around her feet, she wore jeweled lockets. The bodily luster and beauty of Rukmini appeared as if painted by an artist, perfectly presenting beauty following the description of great poets. The breast of Rukmini is described as being a little bit high, indicating that she was just a youth, not more than 13 or 14 years old. Her beauty was specifically intended to attract the attention of Krishna. Although the princes gazed upon her beautiful features, she was not at all proud. Her eyes moved restlessly, and when she smiled very simply, like an innocent girl, her teeth appeared just like lotus flowers. Expecting Krishna to take her away at any moment, she proceeded very slowly towards her home. Her legs moved just like a full-grown swan, and her ankle bells tinkled very mildly. As already explained, the great chivalrous princes who assembled there were so overwhelmed by Rukmini's beauty that they almost became unconscious. Full of lust, they hopelessly desired Rukmini's hand, comparing their own beauty with hers. Srimati Rukmini, however, was not interested in any of them. In her heart, she was simply expecting Krishna to come and carry her away. As she was adjusting the ornaments on her left-hand finger, she happened to look upon the princes and suddenly saw that Krishna was present amongst them. Although Rukmini had never before seen Krishna, she was always thinking of him. Thus, she had no difficulty in recognizing him amongst the princely order. Krishna, not being concerned with the other princes, immediately took the opportunity of placing Rukmini on his chariot, marked by a flag bearing an image of Garuda. He then proceeded slowly, without fear, taking away Rukmini, exactly as the lion takes the deer from the midst of the jackals. Meanwhile, Balaram appeared on the scene with the soldiers of the Yadu dynasty. Jarasandha, who had many times experienced defeat by Krishna, began to roar. How is this? Krishna is taking Rukmini away from us without any opposition? What is the use in our being chivalrous fighters with arrows? My dear princes, just look. We are losing our reputation by this action. He is just like the jackal taking away the booty from the lion. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the 52nd chapter of Krishna. Krishna kidnaps Rukmini.